Okay, so um, welcome everybody. We are going to be looking at um, the progress in sprints 54 and 55 today. Um, we do have a couple updates on the team side. Um, specifically, the core team has now actually been split into two. So we've got um, now the core platform team and the core functional team. So the core platform team is focused on well, platform functionality as well as continuous integration and deployment um, DevOps type activities. Um, while core functional is right now focused on resource access um, features, so loans, requests, and so on, um, but the core functional team will still um, remain responsible for you know, the functional areas that were previously owned by the general core team. So um, inventory, codec search, um, settings, users, those sorts of things. Um, so uh, core team has been split. And let's see. Um, oh, here's the core platform um, team makeup. You can see it's a lot of the people who were on the core team um, before. So a lot of index data folks, um, but a few um, folks who've moved over from the EBSCO team, like Hung Wei. Um, Mark Stacy is still on the team from University of Colorado. Eric um, is from EBSCO. So um, not anyone who's really new to the project in terms of developers and DevOps, but um, some people new to the core platform team. Um, Jakob is the dev lead um, and the PO for this team. And we do have um, Alexander as a scrum master. He's new to the project. And Peter Murray is, well, he's not new to the project, but he's new to this team as um, product owner for internationalization, non-functional requirements. And this is the core functional team. Um, again, lots of people from um, the original core team and then a few additions from EBSCO. So um, Matt Reno, Martin Tran and Magda um, from EBSCO. And then we'll have a rotating sort of group of developers from um, Texas A&M, um, Jeremy, William and Ryan. And uh, Ryan's been on the team um, so far last sprint doing lots of good work. Um, and then uh, in terms of leads, both Mark and Jakob are co-tech leads on this team. Alexi has joined the project new. Um, he is the scrum master. And then there's a lot of POs who are um, providing stories for this team. And I'm playing the role of uh, PO lead, just trying to keep things organized. Um, Stripes Force, um, no one new here except, well, I guess, um, so Zach Burke is, um, sort of just now um, going to start contributing to Stripes Force as well as to the core um, functional team. So um, we're excited to see him contributing there as well. And on the UNAM team, we do have a new developer. Um, Sergio is a um, programmer who's joined that team. So welcome, Sergio. And then I think that was it for new team members. Let me just quickly scan through. Yep. All right. So welcome to all the new folks. Um, just wanted to give an update on the Q4 release. So um, the Q4 release, which is our first named release, it's called Aster, went out on January 14th. And you can play around with it um, at, at this uh, index data hosted environment here. Um, we also have release notes up on the wiki that show all of the UX prod features that were in for the release, plus, you know, known issues, bugs that were fixed, and so on. It was a really productive release. Um, it included actually 96 features. 96 UX prod features were completed um, during this release period, which is up from 40 and 38 in Q2 and Q3. So a significant jump in output. Um, and so... Um, really nice to see that and it looks like for q1 we are you know along those same lines i think it's something like 100 features targeted for q1 at the moment so um a really productive quarter and um congratulations to everyone and thank you um, for all your contributions oh and here's a slide on q1 um so we did start q1 on the 14th as well and we are scheduling uh, release for April 8th and yeah there's the exact number 102 features as of today um, for that release 
um, we've got our dashboard up as well. So if you want to take a look at the details of the release, you know, how does it break down by Epic or um, by development team and so on, just uh, take a look in JIRA at that dashboard. All right, I'm going to turn it over to Jakob to talk about the definition of done. Thank you, Tate. Uh, we are continuing to roll out the new definition of done um, uh, and clarify some of the requirements for uh, for releasing code and for demoing the code. So I'll just summarize some stuff that is relevant for the sprint reviews. Um, we would like to demo only stories that have passed manual QA and um, there might be some exceptions to that rule uh, for proof of concepts. Uh, some functionality, backend functionality that is hard to review, etc. But in general, the, uh, the code that is demoed should be already reviewed either by the PO or manual testers. Um, the UI integration tests were applicable, um, uh, should be executed locally uh, and pass for any pull request that is open. Uh, so if there is a change to any of the uh, specifically any of the core modules, <coughs> core APIs and, and core UI uh, module functionality, those tests, those integration tests that uh, are stored uh, along with the platforms uh, should be executed. Um, and as agreed, uh, we would like to increase the coverage, uh, the unit test coverage level for, uh, for the UI code in Folio. Um, and uh, and the, the, the goal has been set uh, for 80% um, of unit test coverage for new code. So this is new code only. Uh, uh, it applies to all uh, uh, new pull requests issued for UI modules. Those tests um, are being written using the big test testing framework. Um, and the coverage uh, can be uh, viewed, can be verified using the Sonar Cube integration. Um, and as discussed, the demos should be preferably uh, performed on a shared environment, um, integration, integration environment. This environment might differ for different teams. Some teams may uh, choose uh, to run their own integration environment. Uh, other teams rely on the common integration environment and that environment will be done for your snapshot. Uh, because it is a shared environment, uh, it is susceptible to um, breakage uh, if uh, the code deployed in any of the modules is, is, is faulty for some reason. Um, uh, that's why it should be verified between uh, before, uh, before the, uh, the review uh, that the functionality provided, that the functionality merged triple request is actually valid. And those, <coughs> those guards uh, that I ex explained above uh, are very important to achieve this goal. So the unit test coverage and the integration test um, uh, success. Uh, and going forwards, um, we would like to increase the frequency of uh, module releases. Uh, the modules in Folio can be released uh, essentially with any re frequency at this point, and some of the modules, some of the, especially the infrastructural software is released pretty often, uh, every week or every two weeks. Uh, however, there is no such requirement across uh, the Folio project. The only requirement um, that Folio has right now is that releases are provided for the quarterly, uh, quarterly releases. Um, what this means in practice is that a lot of integration effort ends up pushed to the end of the quarter. Um, and throughout the quarter, uh, we can provide more stable folio builds. Uh, so there is uh, an ongoing discussion about increasing the frequency for releases uh, depending on, you know, on what is, what is acceptable. Um, uh, to the team, the proposed frequency is either per sprint or per uh, every two sprints, which would essentially coincide with this demo that we that we just have. And I think that's the general update. Uh, the details of the definition of them will be, of course, uh, discussed across teams. Um, and I'll be happy to, to answer any questions if there are any. Okay. 
Okay. Sounds like there are no questions. Um, but if you think of some later, you can ask them either later in this meeting or um, send them to Jakob. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Go ahead. Don't don't hesitate and drop me notes because I think this is something that needs to be well understood across every team. So if you guys have any questions or any reservations, please uh, let me know. All right. Thanks, Jakob. Thank you. Okay, so um, the product owners have put in um, a slide for highlights for each of their teams. Um, so um, we won't go through these now. Um, I suppose we could come back to them if we have time after the demos. There's obviously a lot of work happening that you don't see in the demos. Um, so if you're interested in the details, um, please come in and check out these slides. Um, I'm just going to skip right through them and that takes me to the demos um, and we've got uh, the acquisitions team, Foley Jet, Stripes Force Vega, Unum and Core Functional demoing today um, and we'll kick off with the acquisitions folks, Dennis, Alexi and Peter. Excellent, thanks so much Kate. I just wanted to say a couple of things before we get into demos. Basically, reiterate the fact that we are working on a handful of modules at the moment. There was lots of work done in vendors and also some work done on finance, uh, finance application. Today's demo is gonna focus primarily on the orders module because we, we've done some demo for vendor last time we were all together. And there's a lot of functionality, there's a lot of work that's been put into this orders app um, to get to where it is right now, that's work being done by three different teams, the Thunderjet group, the Stacks group, and some of the EBSCO FSC team as well. And so the demo today is actually being done from the testing environment. And reason for that being there are a few of the components that aren't existing elsewhere uh, in a stable enough form. And, and those things do make it a uh, much more meaningful demo. So. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Alexi, I believe. He's going to start with showing functionality relating to uh, the creation of orders and for store lines. Alexi, are you muted? Sure. Thank you. Thank you, Emery. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, so I'm going to proceed with demo uh, for orders uh, on folio testing, uh, as Dennis mentioned. Believe me, we do have reasons. Uh, and uh, I can start from settings for our module. Uh, so we implemented um, Purchase order lines limit setting. It's a number of lines that order can consist of. Uh, by default, it's one, uh, but it can be adjusted here. Uh, and uh, we do have reasons for closing a purchase order. Uh, it's a, a user predefined values. Uh, he can manage it here. Uh, edit, delete, uh, so on. Uh, so we go to the orders app and uh, uh, I can show you uh, the creation of PO line. Uh, so as you can see, uh, this order contains uh, one PO line. Uh, we can actually uh, go and delete it. So now it contains uh, zero. We can add the new one. Uh, these fields are editable, uh, just fill the required fields. It's acquisition method, uh, order format. Order format contains uh, different uh, formats, electronic, physical resource, or mix of them, and uh, 
it uh, controls the block of information as e-resource details or, or physical resource. It's uh, different information uh, for different kind of resources uh, that could be acquired. So uh, again, we should specify a price and a quantity. Estimated price will be calculated automatically. Uh, somewhere here, yeah, create PL line button. And we do have a new PL line created. Uh, so we have P line details pane with uh, information uh, we entered. Uh, we can go back and try to add another. And since the limit is one, uh, user will get such message uh, where he can uh, create new purchase order with information uh, gathered from this particular order. So since uh, uh, this order has PL number, uh, as you see, with three at the end, by clicking on create new purchase order, uh, it will create a new purchase order with uh, PL number, the, the new PL number, and uh, we can uh, proceed with new PLN creation. And that clones the PO level details from the previous one, is that right? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay. Um, also, we do have a kind of validation, but shouldn't be surprised. Uh, and in item details, we have a title field. We can uh, enter manually or select from inventory. Uh, we have such uh, pop-up. We can search or select from the list. Uh, it will filter right now uh, just the title. And uh, it's created. Uh, yep. Uh, so regarding regarding purchase order, we have uh, one thing. Uh, renewals we have implemented uh, such thing as uh, order type ongoing uh, can, can contains renewal information uh, so right now it's a required field uh, so we just have to choose a vendor And as you can see, renewal information uh, showed here. Uh, so since uh, uh, this uh, purchase order in workflow status open, uh, it could be closed. And we do have a button close here. So uh, it's available only on uh, open orders. In, in pending, is there no such button? Uh, so, uh, we can hit this button, we will get this model window with a uh, reason to close this order. It contains a number of predefined uh, reasons, like commonly used, and uh, uh, several reasons uh, what we have seen in settings page uh, that user can manage himself. Uh, also, there is a area, text area for any nodes. 
by clicking on submit button, uh, order will go to what all state is closed and uh, we can observe reason and notes here. Uh, basically, that's it from me. I think uh, Pedro can proceed with another cool features. Uh, thank you. I think uh, I'll answer, I can answer questions after the Pedro demonstrations. So, thank you. Okay, hi everyone. So, let me share my screen. Please let me know if you already, I hope at least that you already can see my screen. And uh, uh, Alexei started uh, a demonstrated settings, I will continue. And I would like to demonstrate uh, an enhancement made to purchase order number. There is uh, a setting, a menu setting. And once uh, uh, admin uh, clicks this, we can see two sections appear. Uh, the first one, uh, contains only a checkbox, uh, which basically defines whether or not uh, purchase order number can be uh, edited manually. If this uh, checkbox is unselected and uh, user creates new order, uh, the system will generate uh, a sequential purchase order number and uh, it can't be edited. However, there are uh, optional prefix prefix and suffix, and uh, uh, both of these uh, fields can be uh, selected, so uh, user can customize uh, final purchase order number. So prefix uh, we can s and suffix, uh, the second section, we can see that uh, uh, there is, uh, for prefix, uh, we already uh, see th three uh, prefixes selected. In total, we have four. So one is unselected, and uh, which means that uh, it won't be available in uh, dr drop-down list uh, when user creates new order. So okay. same for, for suffixes. S uh, user can search for any uh, suffix, and if uh, there is no any uh, desired, uh, user can edit. By default, once uh, uh, this the prefix or suffix uh, created, it's not uh, uh, automatically enabled, so user can again uh, expand this list and uh, select. So we see that uh, the second suffix is already also available. Uh, after saving the changes, uh, uh, user might go to uh, orders. And uh, as I mentioned, uh, upon uh, order creation, the system automatically generated pure number, but uh, uh, user might edit it. And prefixes, three prefixes were selected and they appear in this list. For example, I select this one and suffixes, uh, two suffixes selected. We can see that uh, two also can be, one of uh, uh, the value can be selected. As a pure number can be edited, and for example, user doesn't like the system generated one, uh, it can be edited. And uh, the whole combination of prefix, uh, number, and suffix is uh, alphanumeric. So if uh, a user specifies something like this and goes to the next uh, field, we can see that uh, validation says that num uh, order number is not valid. So again, if uh, user doesn't uh, uh, want to correct manually entered pure number, he can rest it and uh, system again probably is a generated one. So let's uh, select something uh, manually and uh, uh, to create an order, we just need to select also a vendor and order type as uh, Alexei already demonstrated. So once we are happy with the order details and click purchase order number, we see that a uh, new order just uh, appeared and uh, it's already, uh, it's, uh, the value of pure number consists of uh, uh, prefix plus number manually entered and suffix. Uh, user can uh, go and modify it. Uh, when order is being modified, the prefix and suffix uh, uh, list already disabled, but user still can uh, modify the, the whole number uh, manually. The same validation rules, if uh, incorrect uh, uh, symbol is entered, a system will complain about it. Same here, user might wa uh, want to raise it to system generated, and we'll see that uh, some number is generated. If user is happy with this pure number, 
uh, after clicking update order, we see that uh, uh, pure number updated. And this, uh, uh, this is re reflected in the list. So last setting I mentioned already is this checkbox. If user, uh, some tenants might, might uh, uh, do not allow to edit system generated uh, order numbers, so this should be unchecked and uh, saved. In this case, when we go and create new order, system again generated uh, next sequential number, but uh, this time it's not editable. But prefix still and suffix uh, uh, still can be selected. So uh, we can complete this order. And uh, uh, verify that uh, it works as expected. So we are done and hit and create purchase order. Uh, we see that uh, order created and uh, uh, the number is uh, as we expected. Upon edit of this order, PO number is not editable as defined in the settings, so user can't edit anymore this number. But anyway, uh, the order can be removed, uh, totally removed. So basically, I think that's it all uh, which I wanted to demonstrate related to these functionalities. So if any questions, please let me know. Thank you for your attention. Thanks, guys. That looked great. It's really robust and also really polished. Um, cool. Uh, all right, so um, next up is Fully Jet with Anne-Marie and Victor presenting. Thanks, Kate. So Victor is going to present in just a minute. Um, just to give you a, a little context, so FolaJet's working on data import, and um, the the big things from the the UI side is that we made some refinements to how we're handling uploaded files in terms of um, controlling the types of files that can be uploaded and uh, navigation if if you've started uploading and then you start to navigate away from that page um, being able to get back to that page we also started work on the file extension settings which are going to control what types of files can be uploaded for data import and what types of rules are going to apply to those files so those are what victor is going to demo um, behind the scenes lots of work on big tests so that we could start applying the uh, testing to the ui screens and planning for migration of the MARC records uh, out of inventory storage and into source record storage. Um, created a library of ISBN stuff and continued lots of infrastructure for the, the data import uh, to get up and running. So Victor is going to demo. Um, we wanted Sasha to demo. Unfortunately, he's out today. Um, Sasha did a lot of what you're going to see for the upload um, uh, messages and warnings. And Victor mainly did the file extension work this, this past couple sprints. Yep. Uh, hi, everyone. Uh, do you hear me? Please confirm it. Yes. Yeah. Uh, great. So. Uh, Let's start uh, with functionality. Probably we have already shown uh, this one, but just in order to make sure that this is this is shown uh, when we try to upload uh, uh, files with different extensions, uh, we have we're gonna have a message about uh, which saying which that we only uh, possible there is only possible to upload files with uh, same extension so in that case we can proceed with selecting uh, selecting files and and it will be okay and only in case we select um, uh, several files with the same extension so this is just about it and uh, also this is uh, uh, part of functionality which uh, Sasha has done. Uh, that uh, once we have something uh, uploaded, uh, uh, this moves to the in, in draft uh, mode state, and uh, in that case, uh, further we will be able to resume this procedure. But for now, we only have functionality to uh, 
to delete uh, this procedure. So the main idea is to have only one uh, scene in draft uh, at a time in order to not create uh, too many other things. And the last thing to show uh, here is about uh, selecting two uh, very big files. Uh, and uh, there is a backend work which is done according to this in order to measure the available memory. And in that case, when we have not enough on the server, we are gonna see an error message that there is not enough uh, space to store our data. And this, in this case, uh, nothing are gonna be created uh, on the backend. So in that case, we don't have anything in draft state. So this is all uh, about uh, data import and its refinement and as I said there, there will be further stories for resuming the stuff and uh, can I just Victor I think trial and error we discovered on the on the index data servers about 400 megabytes was the was the cutoff for a file size is that right yep, yep. so now let's continue to file extensions uh, and this is uh, Hosted in within the settings application for data import, and here we have our extensions uh, link. And uh, upon clicking on it, we can see our extension list, which is pretty much based on the MLC component, MCL component, and actually search and search component. So uh, there should be some uh, amount of work in order to uh, adjust this search and search component to our needs. And what usually is done. <laughs> here and uh, this is pretty common uh, view where we can uh, sort uh, and select something and uh, uh, again this, this is also our further scope in order to accomplish this and uh, for now it's only possible to uh, uh, to search by the one field and in that case we can uh, search by some some extension and uh, also the last thing which I want to demonstrate is about uh, pop-up, which uh, leads to some uh, learn more information, which is hosted on the uh, Confluence. And this page is gonna be uh, extended. And also this uh, was uh, required additional work to the info pop -over component, which needs to be closed when we click those learn more button. And uh, so it is not uh, hanging uh, on the page when we return back to the page. So this is pretty much it. Thank you. Any questions? And so just to um, uh, mention for the file extensions, what we wanted to do was to, to keep someone from accidentally uploading files that are not gonna work well for data import. So any of the picture formats are not gonna be appropriate. Um, so we've, we've got a kind of master list of things like JPEG should not be uh, uh, tried to be imported for data import. Um, the MRK files, which are the broken mark files from MarkEdit are not appropriate, but MRC or MARC are appropriate. Um, and then the next piece is going to be allowing users to add or change the system file extensions so that if you have other file extensions that are your normal ones to import or ones that you wanna be able to block, um, you'll be able to add those to the standard list. Or, or edit any of these in the standard list. So that's our piece for next time. Yep. And also, I uh, remembered that you I wanted to mention me about uh, adding icons uh, where it's possible. So now we have only one for updated field. Uh, the further one will be for user field. And uh, for the further markups, we also will have another uh, bunch of uh, icons. So. This is uh, just our further scope also to uh, to be possible to for adding uh, some icons. Right, and that's part of Philip's kind of updated uh, UI designs is to start adding icons into these results lists. So we're trying to follow that. Yep. So thanks everyone. Thank you, Victor. Thanks, Anne-Marie. Looks really good. Um, okay, so next up is Yuri from Stripes Force. Yeah, hi everyone. Can you hello. hear me? Yes. 
Okay, let me share my screen. One second, please. Can you see it? Yes. Oh, good. Uh, so previously for making user experience uh, uh, better, we have developed uh, an approach related uh, to the UI filters, which you can see here in this uh, left panel, uh, uh, which uh, gives us a possibility uh, to uh, be not tied uh, to common search and filter component uh, and uh, implement uh, uh, a set of uh, custom filters uh, specific uh, for uh, each UI model. Also, it gives us a uh, possibility to uh, assign uh, uh, filters uh, sections uh, like close by default or, or open. Uh, for this approach, we developed uh, uh, for the moment uh, two components. Uh, one of them is uh, checkbox uh, filters and uh, uh, another one is a uh, multi-selection filter. Uh, so here you can see uh, like we try out uh, this approach uh, on uh, uh, the codex search repository uh, UI module. And here you can see uh, like from the UI it changes, it's uh, only uh, uh, one new thing that, that I want to mention that uh, this language filter previously uh, it was, uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it was present, represented uh, like a checkbox set, uh, and uh, uh, here, I'm sorry, one second. <clears throat> and here you can see it uh, like a multi selection. So, to demonstrate it work, uh, I uh, uh, have created uh, uh, three. Uh, local titles uh, with different uh, languages. And uh, here you can see that if we can, for example, uh, search by English language, here we can see this item with English and German language. We can uh, search by another language, for example, French. And here we got it. So I think that's it from my side. Uh, thank you for the intention. Maybe, do you have any questions? Looks nice. It's uh, a big improvement. And it looks like there's that same component again that people are chatting about from tags. Looks really nice. Thank you, Yuri. You're welcome. Um, okay, so next up is Dimitro from Vega. Uh, yep. Hello, everyone. So let me share my screen. Please let me know is if in case issue appears. Um, so today uh, I am going to demonstrate the functionality of renewal overrides. Um, uh, this functionality allows user uh, to commit a renewal uh, in case a simple renewal fails. There is there is a list of reasons where it can be done. So let's go and create a precondition for the failed renewal. So for example, a loan policy. Uh, we can mark it is as not renewable and we should get a failure message about this i'm clicking the renew button and now here i got um, the list of, of failed renewals and the reason that a loan is not renewable. I can click an override button and here I can um, uh, proceed with uh, override renewal. Uh, here I can select uh, which um, items I, I'd like to uh, renew. And as uh, this item mark be marked as not renewable, there is no information how we can calculate uh, the a new due date, uh, so it should be selected manually. 
and uh, there is a possibility to add a comment to uh, the renewal to maybe show the reason why um, it was uh, over overridden. And here we have item and um, records in a history that item was renewed through override and the comment. And let's uh, create another precondition for the uh, failed renewal. In case um, er, some item has reached uh, uh, the limit of allowed renewals. Here we have here we have uh, two items and uh, with renewal count one. So each the simple renewal should fail. And here we have uh, in the error message that loan has reached uh, the maximum of renewals, and we can override them. Uh, the difference from the previous uh, case is that um, loan just reached the limit, and we still can calculate the due date uh, as um, the in as. Um, 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 the item can uh, just can be uh, renewed, uh, not uh, taking into account the uh, limit. And here we have this record. Uh, the third uh, uh, precondition is when. Uh, um, when the item, when the uh, loan policy, when the loan policy is um, uh, has uh, is limited with the fixed due date schedule, and uh, the loan date is outside of uh, the date ranges for um, this uh, schedule. So I'll change the schedule. And re renew again. Uh, and so here we have a new message that uh, renewal date falls outside of date ranges for a limited schedule. And uh, there is also second reason the loan has reached maxim maximum of number of renewals as in previous case. <clears throat> And now, and it's also uh, appeared in uh, history. And the last uh, case, it's when the loan policy is fixed. Uh, and uh, uh, we use the same fixed due date schedule that is, um, uh, and the renewal date uh, falls outside of ranges. The difference from the previous case is that when the loan, loan policy is fixed, there is no information how we can calculate uh, the new due date after renewal, so it should be also selected manually. Um, so I think that is all from my side. Please ask me questions if you have some. That looks great, Dimitro. I know that's super complex functionality, all those different scenarios. It looks really good. Thank you. Um, okay, next up is Holly demoing for UNAM. Okay, I will unmute myself here and hopefully my test case is still set up. It is. Okay, so uh, what I'm going to demo today is uh, the patron block feature. Um, 
for patron blocks, we have uh, two types. Uh, one is what we're calling a manual patron block. And this is a patron block that a library staff member would actually go out and manually set up. We also have uh, automated patron blocks. And these are patron blocks that are going to be triggered by events in the system. Um, these don't exist yet, but these would be blocks um, such as um, a library may say, um, if a patron owes more than $100 in fees and fines, uh, we would like them to be blocked from using services until they get their balance in, you know, back under $100, or if they have uh, 25 overdue books, we want to, um, you know, not allow them to check out any more books until they get their balance under control. So these uh, are the amount of, of overdue books under control. So there are automated um, blocks, but we also need to have a way to do um, manual blocks. And a lot of times uh, a manual block will be related uh, to something that the patron, um, you know, something that can't be controlled in an automated way. Um, for example, uh, perhaps uh, you have emailed the patron about um, an overdue notice and the emails keep bouncing back and you mailed the patron um, a notice and the uh, email is being returned, or the, the snail mail is being returned to the library. So now you realize that you have no way to contact the patron. And so uh, your best bet is to block them from using services until they get in touch and give you uh, a new contact information. Um, so there are some cases like that where uh, you will want to do a manual block. And so to accommodate um, the Chambers impl implementation, we went ahead and put the manual blocks in so that they would be able to, um, uh, to do whatever kind of block they needed to. So for the patron that we have here, Cody, um, this person, if you look at, at what they have going on here, um, they have five open loans, five closed loans. Um, as far as fees and fines go, they have um, five closed fees and fines and five open fees and fines. Um, so if you look at their open fees and fines, you'll see that basically every item they've checked out from the library, they've damaged in some way. Um, so they owe us $365 in fees and fines. And um, since the only kind of block we have right now is a manual block, um, we are going to block them until they get their fees and fines under control. So we are going to add a manual block and we're going to say, um, Patron owes 365. Never, I, I usually don't put any kind of a designation over what kind of currency it is. I've just gotten in that habit. Um, Okay, and so uh, that is the only required field uh, on this page, except you also have to specify what you want to block. So um, it's possible that you just want to block borrowing, uh, maybe you just want to block, block renewals uh, uh, or requests. This person is really um, bad, you know, they owe us a lot of money. Uh, so we're just going to block everything until they until they pay up. Um, you do have some optional fields here. You could um, you could put in a note to your fellow staff members. Um, 
you know, there may be something that you uh, want to want to say uh, privately that you don't want anyone else uh, to see. There's also a message you could put in for the patron. Um, so you could say, um, you know, please contact. Um, and then that would be something that the library, of course, would have to pick up and include in their uh, patron interface. Um, but you could put information about how to reach us, you know, how to reach someone and how to pay your fees of, you know, you can put whatever you want in there. You can also specify an expiration date if you want the block to, to automatically expire on a certain day. Um, in this case, um, I'm not going to do that. So I'm going to create the block. So now um, we have a block and we try to make it uh, pretty noticeable so that when you come out to look at user information, you're going to know that the patron um, has a block in place. You can do more than one block. Um, so if, if for some reason you wanted to, you could add another block and it just will keep adding them here. Um, so there may be another reason um, why, why you would want to uh, put a block. Uh, there may be one that expires by a certain date and one that uh, doesn't have an end date. Um, also, when we add automated blocks, um, you know, you may have a patron that has a mix. They may have one manual and several automated, um, you know, who knows? Um, if you click on the row of the block, then you can go back out and edit it. Um, so you could actually, you know, put a date in if you wanted to and save it. Um, that's also how you can delete it here. Um, okay. So now I'm gonna show you uh, how the block uh, gets enforced. So as you know, uh, we uh, indicated that borrowing, renewing, and requests are blocked. So I'm gonna to go to checkout and put in the person's barcode. And this message pops up. Patron owes over $365 in fees and fines, must get under $100. And we also specify that there's a block in place. Um, so at this point, uh, the, the person working, the staff member working could just close this. They could go look at block details, which is probably uh, likely. Um, and this is actually supposed to, uh, we'll be fixing this, but this is supposed to uh, be open when you come to, uh, come to this so that it's very clear what kind of block the person has. Um, and then the person could either remove the block. Right now you would have to remove the block uh, to make this uh, work. Um, in the future, Uh, in the future, you would have to, um, you could uh, actually do an override. Um, so if I tried to check out something here, it won't let me, it just keeps telling me that I have a block. Um, so you're, you're kind of stuck. Uh, in the future, there'll be an override button and then somebody who has the power to do the override would be able to override the block for just this transaction. I'm not sure that they would want to for this particular patron, but there will be times when that you, you will want to do an override and you'll be able to do it just for this transaction, but the block will stay in place. Okay, and so that's an example of um, blocking someone from doing, uh, from checking out material. Then um, you also will be blocking from doing a request. And, um, oh, I guess I would need 
to have an item and it has to be an item that's checked out. Okay, so one thing that I noticed, I meant to report this, but um, I did notice that you can actually request, do a request on an item that you have checked out, which I thought was kind of odd. But anyway, so I'm going to do a request for this item. Okay. And then, um, oh goodness, what was my user's barcode? Here we go. Oh, that's right. That's a problem. Well, I think it doesn't matter. Yeah, because it doesn't matter if you actually have an item. So this is telling me that once again, you know, that it's blocking the request um, because the patron has uh, the fees and fines and you can do the same thing. Um, the only thing that's different here that we need to work on is that it does clear out. So if you go, if you go look at the block and then you want to go back and, and perhaps, you know, let the re get rid of the block and let the request go through, the request is actually gone. And so we do have a um, JIRA issue in um, to take a look at that. Um, and then the other um, thing that's, that you can block is the renewal. So this patron has um, a bunch of items checked out and uh, renewal you can do multiple ways. Uh, so you can do I'm going to do a batch of them. And of course, I clicked on renew and it says that I can't renew because, you know, you can't renew them because the patron owes um, over $365 in fees and fines. And like I said, there, there'll be an override button. Um, but once again, the patron's being blocked from doing this. And uh, in addition to adding the automated um, blocks, uh, w one thing that came up um, that isn't being planned, uh, you know, as part of this initial uh, release of folio, if you want to call it that, is um, is uh, not allowing access to online resources, uh, which is probably um, a really good way to get the patrons to to take action. Um, because if you would block them from using um, online resources, I think that would um, that would be a really, you know, instead of just from from using um, physical material, that would be a good way to um, to get some action out of the patrons. So there are places that are asking for that feature um, to include online material. Um, so that could be something that we do in the future. So we might be expanding some of what get uh, uh, institution is allowed to block. Um, does anybody have any questions? I guess not quite group today. No, just a bad patron that owes three hundred dollars <laughs> in fines. <laughs> this looks great, Holly. Thank you so much for the demo. The context was yeah. really helpful. And I'm, I didn't develop it. The UNOM team did. Um, and I think some of them are here. But um, yeah, they did a great job. So yeah, it's impressive. Just one quick yeah. question. Uh, sorry, I was trying to unmute. Um, so Holly and Kate or anyone, um, have we stress test this with sort of like the, just out of curiosity, with renewals and number of renewals done? I, not so much the blocks, but I was, I just hadn't asked this before. Um, what's the largest number of sort of automatic renewals that you can do? Is there a system oh. kind of maximum? Because I've worked in, I've worked in a couple of ARL libraries where we, you have faculty members who have upwards of 800 items checked out at any one time and you ask, <laughs> and, and you ask to, and they ask to do just renew all of them uh, and you know, sort of like push them into the next section. And I remember with Voyager and uh, Olive um, in different institutions, uh, 
the system kind of crashed uh, or had a maximum that they were figuring out? Yeah, I don't, I can't answer that question. Um, okay. I, don't, I didn't work on loans, but that, okay. if that's something that hasn't been done, that's, you're definitely right. I mean, they yeah. will have hundreds of books. Oh, yeah. And they will just keep renewing them. Um, until I mean, until you clean out their office. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think at Cornell, I think we stopped doing due dates for professors, but um, yeah. for places that do, you know, that would be a very good, I don't know if, if use case, on yeah. the call, but that would be a very good, um, very good test to do. Okay, great. I will, uh, yeah. I will figure out or I'll check in with you about who to talk with later. Thank you. Okay, sounds good. Thanks, Mark. Thanks. Anything else for Holly? Thanks. Thank you, Holly. Thank you, Unam. Um, okay, so last team is the core functional team, and we're going to start with Michal. Um, hi, Kate. Hey. Hi, everyone. I'm just sharing my screen here. Just move this around. Um, can you um, can you see my screen here? No. Or? Yep. Yes. Oh, great. So um, I have a couple different stories. I also will be presenting some of the work from Aditya. Aditya is out. Um, so maybe I will start with, with those stories first. Um, so the first thing, thing Aditya was working on here is to hide some of the information related to the loan on the item when the item is uh, has a, a waiting pickup status or um, in transit status. Uh, so basically, I, I believe before we would show the borrower here in loan loan date and due date, but those those will be you know, hidden now. So that's the that's the first change from Aditya. Um, the second change um, right now is related to the check in, and I'm going to try to check in an item which has um, multiple pieces attached to it. So let's see what happens here. Um, and as you can see, we are presented now with this new um, multi-piece check-in dialogue. And this will happen every time we will uh, try to check in an item which has multiple uh, pieces uh, attached, attached to, uh, bundled together. Uh, in this case, we have a book and DVD, and you can see that one of the uh, pieces is missing. Um, so that's, that's a new addition here to the check-in screen. I will try to continue. And, and this is... This is yet another uh, change uh, Aditya introduced. This is um, uh, a new dialogue which will pop up to to show that this item is in transit. So this this happens because I'm now um, at the circulation desk number two, but this item has to uh, go to circulation desk number one, and um, that's that's exactly when you will see this uh, this uh, dialogue. Uh, present. We can also print the slip here, but I'm just going to skip skip this for now. Um, another change, which is a smaller change here, is that when you try to check in an item which doesn't exist, you will be presented with this new dialog here, uh, which says it just says that item is not found. Um, I believe before we we just had a little red error run under, under this uh, input. Uh, text input field, but now we have this nice, nice new dialogue. Um, and I believe that's, that's it from Aditya. I, I will just move now to some of the work I've done. Um, so first change here is um, this new dialogue, which should pop up when you try to check out an item for the borrower, which has another item which is waiting pickup under the same location. So this is kind of just for the reminder um, um, for that borrower that there, there may be another item waiting for him under or for, under this lo location. Um, so this is new, new addition. Uh, then when I try to actually check out an, an item and the, the item is also has also multiple uh, pieces attached to it, uh, we will be presented with the very similar um, dialogue to what you what you've seen uh, under check-in. So again, this this item has multiple pieces one of them is missing and and um yeah we can just go ahead and check it out here um i think that's that's another change and then the last last uh thing i would like to show you here is we, we are back again in the inventory app and um, when we are on on the item screen we have this new 
action uh, available to us, which allows us to create a new request right from, from this uh, screen. So if I hit a uh, new request here, it, I will be taken to the uh, requests app module and my item information will be populated automatically and I'm, I'm able to kind of continue with creating my new request uh, here. And that, I think that's it for me. Thank you. Thanks, Michal. Any questions? All right. Um, great. Okay. And then um, finally, Nils Eric had something he wanted to show as well. Right. And uh, uh, we're staying in uh, in uh, inventory and in the uh, uh, section of uh, the item page that uh, Michal just showed you, uh, where we display uh, uh, loan information. So uh, I. Uh, picked out uh, an instance here, and we're going to look at the uh, at the the uh, the item uh, record for it, uh, and uh, and we have this um, uh, accordion where, with the the uh, different uh, uh, loan information uh, displayed as uh, Michal just uh, showed you, and there is a, a few more uh, fields added to this. Uh, <clears throat> uh, now you can. Uh, now you can add uh, uh, what we call check in and check out notes. So that would be uh, uh, notes that are displayed uh, to the user when uh, uh, when uh, an item is uh, checked uh, in or checked out uh, as a sort of a, a reminder. So for instance, uh, hold patient's ID at this moment, or you can uh, add a, a, a check in note as well, because uh, Corresponding to them, that uh, we turn ID to patron. Uh, and uh, they would then hope they would then uh, display uh, uh, on the uh, on the item uh, uh, detail record, uh, and uh, the intention is that they're displayed in the in the circulation process as well. And that's all. Nice. Thanks, Nels. I think um, maybe Emma's got stories in the backlog for displaying those in the right. coming sprint. Awesome. And is the staff only checkbox? Is that like if it's unchecked, is it meant to not display at self checkout machines or do we know how that would be used yet? Uh, I'm actually not sure about that, uh, but I'm just assuming that it, it means that it means that it's only displayed in the in the checkout uh, routine because that would be a, a staff person doing that. But, yeah. But uh, but I'm sorry, uh, I'm not the domain no, expert. Yeah. Okay. Um. All right. Any questions for Nils or Michal? All right, um, that's all I had for demos. Let me just pull the deck back up. Make sure I didn't miss anyone. I was just asking one in in the chat for either Charlotte or Michal, for the carrot um, in the inventory item record that um, lets you do the new request, it, was that work that had to be done in inventory and in requests or was it just inventory having to to call over to requests um yeah that's that's a good question so we 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 had to do some work on the inventory to create the correct uh link but then also um, on the request we had to kind of populate it that uh, item automatically so there's a little bit of work on both sides here i'm mary all right good to know because something like that uh, for creating a new order from inventory seems like it could be interesting. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it wasn't like a huge amount of work, as I recall. We had we did a similar thing, create a request from the user record as well. And I think it was, um, yeah, similar yeah. level of effort. Yeah, these this kind of integration on on the client side, they're, they're pretty shallow. Uh, I think so. It shouldn't be a lot of work in, in, in the application that holds the link and then it, the real work uh, is done in, in the application it's linking to. All right, good to know. Thanks.
All right, so just to wrap up, um, we've got uh, two two week sprints ahead of us before we meet again. Um, sprint 56 and 57. And um, we do have uh, for each of the teams, again, the POs have put in details um, for what's planned in the coming couple of sprints. So you can come take a look at those um, if you're interested. Um, and uh, there's also in here, um, unfortunately, Anton was, he's on vacation, so he wasn't able to give his presentation um, or his Q4 QA update in person, but he did um, put a, a sort of report here in this deck. So if you're interested in learning about Bug Fest Week and the current state of quality in um, Folio, then um, you'll want to take a look at these slides as well. And I believe that is it. Any last questions or, or comments? Okay. All right. Well, thanks everyone. I guess we will wrap uh, uh, 15 minutes early and um, uh, thanks so much for everyone who demoed. I will share the deck and recording shortly.